Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the director of adult programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Hanif's books are available through our bookstore ampersand books. I'll put the link in the chat. First, we'll hear Hanif read, and then he'll be in conversation with the poet Tim Siebels. Tim Siebels is the author of several collections of poetry, including Fast Animal, which won the Theodor Rithke Memorial Poetry Prize and was nominated for a National Book Award, and his latest One Turn Around the Sun. Siebel's honors include fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. He was also a judge for the 2020 Lenore Marshall Prize, which selected Hanif Abdurraqib's book, A Fortune for Your Disaster. Hanif Abdurraqib is a poet, essayist, and cultural critic from Columbus, Ohio. His first poetry collection, The Crown Ain't Worth Much, was named a finalist for the Eric Hoffer Book Prize and was nominated for a Hurston Wright Legacy Award. His debut collection of essays, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, was named a Book of the Year by numerous publications. His book of nonfiction, Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest, was a New York Times bestseller and was long listed for the National Book Award. His latest is A Little Devil in America, Notes in Praise of Black Performance. The National, Nashville Review has called A Fortune for Your Disaster, Devastatingly Beautiful, a book born of blood, of heartache, of isolation, of history, of forthing, forging new paths and new endings, a rare accomplishment of poetic language, of music, of heart, of resilience. Hanif, thank you for being here. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. And, and thanks to, um, you know, thanks to everyone who had a hand in putting this together. I have to be honest, I'm, I'm not, not doing all right. And um, the news has perhaps sunken into me perhaps more um, than expected. And so I'm not doing as well as I would like, but I'm excited to be here and, and um, very grateful for everyone involved. And um, you know, it's been so long since I spent time with Fortune, um, but I'm excited to kind of get back into it again. And so I think what I'll do is I will read, <laughs> I joked earlier that I'll get the hits out of the way early. I'll read the, I'll read the poems that I feel like people who have expressed affection for this uh, showed up to hear. And then I'll, I'll just, I, wanna, I would like to read as many of the, the Black people flower poems as I can. But first I'll read the two poems that I think people um, have expressed the most affection for out of this book. It is maybe time to admit that Michael Jordan definitely pushed off. That one time in the 98 NBA finals and in praise of one man's hand on the waist of another's and in praise of the ways we guide our ships to the shore of some brief and gilded mercy, I touch my fingers to the hips of this vast and immovable grief and push once more. And who is to say really how much weight was behind Jordan's palm on that night in Utah? And on that same night, one year earlier, the paramedics pulled my drowning mother from the sheets where she slept and they said it must have felt like a whole hand was pushing down on her lungs and I spent the summer holding my breath in bed until the small black spots danced on the ceiling and I am sorry that there is no way to describe this that is not about agony or that is not about someone being torn from the perch of their comfort and on the same night a year before my mother died Jordan wept on the floor of the United Center locker room after winning another title because it was Father's Day and his father went to sleep on the side of a road in 93 and woke up a ghost and there is no moment worth falling to our knees 
knees and galloping toward like the one that sings our dead back into the architecture. And so yes, for a moment in 1998, Michael Jordan made what space he could on the path between him and his father's small and breathing grace. And so yes, there is an ocean between us, the length of my arm, and I have built nothing for you that can survive it. And from here, I am close enough to be seen, but not close enough to be cherished. And from here, I can see every possible ending before we even touch. What's great about these two poems is that they're on back-to-back -back pages in the book, which I didn't anticipate when I wrote the book. But this, this poem is interesting because I early in the book cycle, like before the book was even out, I read it on NPR and it got such a, a really intense response that it felt like the book's first single. But really, it's kind of an outlier. Um, I think it's an outlier for the book, in my opinion, but I do like it. It's about, I mean, I've told this story a bunch of times, I won't tell it again, but um, this is about the night in Connecticut when all the pizza places ran out of cheese, but it is also definitively uh, about my, the ending of my relationship. The cheese is a metaphor if anyone's keeping track at home. From the humid brick building below my humid brick building, a woman bellows at the pizza man who, it seems, threw no cheese atop the crust in its red river of sauce because, as he shouts above the sirens of State Street and the growing crowd lined outside his shop, it is Friday night and he is woefully short on mozzarella. And there are far better pizza options on every corner of this city, overpriced into night, bursting at the seams with lonely people who will seek the warmth spilling from the edges of a cardboard box and onto their laps and into their fingers on the wall walk back to a newly empty apartment. I love the heat for how it separates the desire for touch from the practicality of it. If it gets too hot to fuck as it did for Mookie and Tina, then we're all on our own sinking islands anyway. There is no cheese in this town anymore. And what could be worse than the fraction of a dream behind every door you crawl to? It is Friday and surely some of my people are praising the fresh coin in their bank accounts. And what a tragedy to spend it on a half finished freedom. In the argument below, has poured out into the streets and the waiting masses. And I imagine this is no longer over cheese, but over every mode of unfulfilled promise. The cluster of sins still stuck to a body fresh from the waters of baptism. The parent who must dig a grave for their youngest child. From below, a man yells, there are only three ingredients. You can't even get that right. And isn't it funny to vow you will love someone until you're dead? Um, all right, I'm going to read a bunch of the flower poems and not to not to convince anyone to stick around or whatever, but um, after Tim and I talk, I'm going to read another poem and I'm going to read a flower poem that did not make it in the book from like the archive that I wrote that I, don't, I think only like a group. So if you want to stick around, I mean, stick around because talking to Tim is great, but I'll also read a poem that not a lot of people have heard before. Sorry. How can Black people write about flowers at a time like this? Dear reader, with our heels digging into the good mud at a swamp's edge, you might tell me something about the dandelion head and how it is not a flower itself, but a plant made up of many small flowers at its crown. And Lord knows I have been called by what I look like more than I have been called by what I actually am. And I wish to return the favor for the purpose of this exercise, which too is an attempt at fashioning something pretty out of seeds, refusing to make anything worthwhile of their burial. Size me up and skip whatever semantics arrive to the top first say that boy he looked like a hollowed out grandfather clock he looked like a million dollar god with a two cent heaven like all it takes is one kiss and before morning you can scatter his whole mind across a field how can black people write about flowers at a time like this Kehende painted that man Barack with roses at his feet. The saying goes, get your roses while you're still alive to smell them. Show me a way to govern without violence and I will show you a way to not feel shame inside of the moment when you recognize your captor 
when you recognize yourself in the face of your captor and fall in love with the familiarity, I too have licked the blood from a mirror in an attempt to more clearly see the lipstick with a familiar slang flooding the tongue. Get me to a curve of a lover's neck while I am still alive enough to my nose to resist disappearing my blessings into ash. Depending on what is in bloom, I might summon the blade. I might undo the forest winding its way along the sides of my face so that I can more closely resemble a man worthy of waking to roses at his feet in a kill or be killed nation give to my open palms something that might die before i do until all that remain are the thorns pushing their lips together and begging for touch how can black people write about flowers at a time like this Drake said, y'all better not come to my funeral with that fake shit. And this is how I knew he'd never slept on a floor by way of his loneliness and empty pockets. What is neither here nor there is that I cling to the past because in it, I had yet to know pain. And therefore I was held only by that which desired my boyish appetite. We buried Tyler and the violets I placed on his grave were plastic and cost $4.99 at the corner store by the punk house where we had cake on his 19th birthday. And there were purple heart shaped petals iced into the corner of it and I am saying that I would not know a real violet if I ran my hands across what I imagine is its silk jaw. I would not know even if you pulled a string of them from your pocket and gently planted the string along my neck and said someone not here thought this would look pretty on you. Friends, the trick to this one is that I laid the plastic on the grave I least wanted to dig. Death itself, that fake shit, I stay praying to show up somewhere. How can black people write about flowers at a time like this? Free love till the check comes and me and mine reach into our fruitless pockets for the wallets we know we left at the crib next to the framed black and whites of our divorced or widowed parents. There were hand-drawn daisies on the De La Soul album cover once and now I stay on that hippie shit. Arms open the length of a day's eye and no one running toward them but in a state of ghosts, hand-drawn from the depths of memory all my worst enemies keep. Native tongue and all that means is I know the exact ground to which my moans owe their treacherous birth. I know which branch of a tree will bend under a storm's weight and offer its palms to my begging mouth. The satisfaction in breaking a loosely cooked egg is in the yellow clawing its way beyond a bondage of white. There is nothing more arrogant than beauty at rest. Dela said D-A-I-S-Y meant the inner sound, y'all, and I guess that explains the insomnia. Y'all, the inner sound is the long silence between a door slamming shut and the kiss of a lock which says you will never again in your life and put that on everything. Put that on the book I slid under a table leg to stop my yoke from running. Put that on any room so empty, every name inside is an echo. How can Black people write about flowers at a time like this? But if you'll indulge my worst impulses, isn't it funny how the white petals of the oleander do not render the crow flightless upon being swallowed, and yet the human body crumbles under the weight of their softness? By funny, you may think the joke is about the black thing consuming a bouquet of whiteness without falling from the sky in droves. But by funny, I mean I am adorning my fingertips with white petals and running a thumb along the edges of your mouth, agape with a rapturous desire. To hoard desire is one way of becoming a fiend. My homie peddled white to fiends who took the white peddled into themselves and some did not survive, but some I imagine grew brief black wings. Having never felt it, I will still wish upon you the feeling of knowing exactly where your next high will be born from. I do not define the distance between sinning and deliverance. I peddled the white bike downtown on a Tuesday. The homie got 15 for hoarding the white he had yet to peddle inside of a suitcase. His mother cried in the courtroom, mad perhaps, with the sudden descent of feathers. Um, I'll, I'll probably read two more of these um, and then I'm, I'm excited to talk to Tim.
I'll read this one last because it's the last one I wrote. I'll read the first one of these I ever wrote and I'll read the last one of these I ever wrote. And they're all in the set, they're all in the final section. They're both in the final section. But this one, um, this one is is a true story that was born out of me backing over my name. I mean, this is real. I backed over my neighbor's peonies when I first moved back to Columbus. Um, and she was so kind. Uh, which she shouldn't have been realistically. I was like on my phone backing out of the driveway. Um, so and every year, like every every time it's peony season, I don't live in that place I live, but anytime it's peony season, I grab some peonies and put them in her garden because I still feel guilt, which is um, just the way my brain works. How can black people write about flowers at a time like this? Forgive me for I have been nurturing my well-worn grudges against beauty. I am hoping my neighbors will show some mercy on me for backing my car into the garden and crushing what I will say were the peonies, a flower with a short season, born dying. Some might say it's a blessing to know your entrances and exits. Forgive me for I have once again been recklessly made responsible for the curation of softness and have instead returned with another torrent of violence. In the brief moment of their flourish at the opening of spring, I drove across state lines to gather peonies for a woman who loved me once as a way of surrender. I pull the already dying thing from the earth in a mess of tangled knots and I insist that you must keep it alive for a year, even after it so desperately wants to be done with the foolishness of its living. The last thing I ask of this relationship is to burden you with another relationship. It is so delicious to define the misery you are putting a body out of. And just like that, we are talking about power. How awful this must be for you, I whispered as I close my eyes and put the car in reverse. How can Black people write about flowers at a time like this? And it turns out lineage is the most vicious stunt of them all. So name me after the first hands to shake the dirt off my arms and lay diamonds on my wrist. Or name me after the pistol kept in the nightstand of a free man who wasn't afraid to use it. You get what I'm saying. Name me for the bride I crane my neck toward each time she runs a pitch black gospel choir back into town. Imperial stunt, gold all in my mouth. So I talk that shit, them white folks shook the hills down for. And now they can't keep my seeds out the air or earth and even the hollow shells of can close a throat before it starts to play me for a fool. Look, I am crowning so wide. I got enough shade to feed 10 summers and 10 porches of women fanning themselves of the Old Testament and leaning in for the good gossip and whispering, don't you know there are whole fields on fire still? And I will take my reparations in the almost fading blonde petals twirling off the black stem like when Nina sang Pirate Jenny and the song became about a slave ship. Name me after the last nigga who held the apocalypse in their palms and rocked it to sleep for long enough to throw one more drink on the tab or the first nigga to have an address everywhere but one rent check. I'm too fly to haunt anything but my own reflection. And so when I'm gone, I'm gone. And the most vicious stun of all is how this was your language first. Thank you. Hey, Tim. Yeah, man, I, I, there's so many things I wanted to say about or talk about your work, but I don't want to get a, a heavy craft thing. You were saying that you were not okay. Is there something you wouldn't talk about that's happening in, in, or, or what? Oh, no, I mean, the Adam Toledo news is, I think, uh, perhaps uh, shaking me a bit more than I expected, you know? Okay. So, um, okay. but it's all right, I'm, you know. Okay. Yeah. Just okay. a lot of thoughts with this family. Okay, yeah, I hear you and I understand that. Um, all right, well, we can talk you know, about the books. One, I wanted to say um, that one of the things I really love about this book, and I know that you, you, it seems that you've probably moved on to the next thing, but I still want to tell you that there's a way that you move through a poem where you braid ideas and emotions that is really intimate in a different kind of way. And I'm not sure I can really explain that, but I wanted to tell you that because if you're like I am, you really have a hard time figuring out what exactly it is that people see in your work sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but what I saw and several other people I know see uh, is the way that you move from idea to emotion or braid idea and emotion and it feels like really intimate, but of course 
that's not exactly the word. It's um, there's just a sense of being spoken to in a crucial way. Maybe that's the best word, a crucial way, like a measured but urgent way. And I love that about this book. I'm I'm not going to go on and on, but I just wanted you to know that that was one of the things that grabbed me and a couple of other people that I know read the book very closely. All right. So anyway, um, I'm real interested in what you do with titles. I mean, that you read the series of how can black people uh, write about uh, flowers that are telling me this, that that's repeated throughout the, the text. I'm just curious about when you were working on th this book, were you thinking about titles in a particular way or is this something that, you know, just, you just, it, it felt right, so you did it. Yeah, I mean, I came up, first off, this is such an honor, Tim, like I'm such, you know, like I don't, I don't know if I've ever expressed this to you, but I expressed it a lot. I'm just such a big fan of your work. And uh, whenever AWP was in Portland, I, we were at an ice cream place sitting next to each other. And I was so afraid to like talk to you because I'm just such a big fan. <laughs> and so I just like sat in silence and ate my ice cream because uh, oh. I didn't want to say what's up. But, uh, but oh, I was I wish, like, I wish you had. <laughs> I know, I know. It was wild. When you left, everyone I was at the table was like, why didn't you say hey? Like, but, um, but thank you for doing this. And thank you for the time words. Oh, my man, work, the honor is mine. Fan. Let me tell you. Um, yeah, titles, you know, I, it's interesting because I came up in an era of music where titles were, you know, 10 to 20 words long and kind of absurd and like pulled from, I'm someone who's very big on pulling um, actual language from the atmosphere of the everyday and then attaching it to the top of a poem. I mean, how can Black people write about flowers at a time like this? I know this is a well-worn story now, but that's actually a quote, direct quote from a white person who was sitting behind me during a Ross Gay reading. Um, <laughs> And like, and it's, you know what I mean? It's like, it was one of those things where That's instead beautiful. of getting, there you go. I think that the easy thing for me to do would have been like, I'm mad at that person for saying that I'm gonna go home and write a poem at that person. But I think right. a much harder thing was, well, how can I ask myself the question of me as someone who grew up not around flowers, who doesn't know anything about flowers, right. how can I ask myself the question of why that bothered me so much knowing nothing about flowers, but very much connecting to Ross Gay's connection with the earth and right. mortality, right? Um, and so I suppose I owe Ross, I mean, I owe Ross a great debt for much of, not just that, but, um, you know, and so, so much of the titles were about how how recyclable is this? Because, you know, there, there's those Marvin Gaye poems and there's those Tesla poems. Right, right. And so much of the book was like, how, how can I recycle multiple ideas to detach myself from the notion of being done with a poem just because I finished one poem. Okay. You know? Okay. All right. Anyway, that was what, for me, um, as, as, a, as a reader, what I loved about it was at a certain point, um, at first I thought, it's funny, he's written two of these poems with the same title. <laughs> I said, he's written a third one. And then I started thinking, I wonder what he's gonna do with the next one. This, that has this title. So after a while, it kind of created an expectation that I that that made the book exciting to me. The same with the Ghost of Marvin Gaye pieces, you know, like you thought, because the, the the Marvin Gaye personas they were did so many things, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I thought every time I saw that title, I was like, okay, you know, I had to you know kind of strap myself in and say, okay, what's he going to do with Marvin Gaye this time? What's so funny about that is that like when we were going through the editing process. One of the things the editor said that I thought was incorrect with all love to the editor was like, I think you need to streamline the Marvin Gaye voice and persona. And I was like, Marvin Gaye was not a streamlined person. I mean, none of us are, but Marvin Gaye was complicated and multitudinous. Yeah. I mean, immensely multitudinous. And yeah. so uh, he, that is, if I'm imagining him hovering, I, I don't think that death would offer him any clarity. That's the whole thing, right? Is that death right. doesn't offer him clarity. Right. Uh, and so I, I wanted to make it so that um, his voice was was as complex as he was. Oh, and you did it. It was it's wonderful, man. I mean, I, I know you've heard all this stuff, but uh, yeah, that's a that book has a lot in it, and I imagine you've read from it many times, and maybe you don't hear it as you did when you were first inventing the poems. But there was a lot, uh, a lot that's worth going back to again and again for me as a reader. Um, I know as the author, your relationship to the work is different. <laughs> But uh, yeah, man, I uh, I love this. I love this book. I've got I've given it to several people too. That's another story for another time. Um, uh, I was wondering about 
your interest in Tesla. Was there something that drew your attention to him in particular? Because I started reading up about him because of this book. Word. Oh, wow. You know, what's interesting is I'm not actually, uh, it's funny, the first time I said this in an interview, I got a bunch of emails from scientists. I'm not actually that interested in Nikola Tesla, the real life scientist person. I'm interested in Tesla as played by David Bowie in the movie The Prestige. Oh, like that's, I know that movie? I yeah, that movie. yeah, you know, so I had framed the whole book after that movie. The whole book was kind of more than the flower poems and more than, it's interesting because I do think the story of the book has become the flower poems, which I'm very fine with. Uh -huh. But actually, I think the story of the book for me was mapping it out through the three stages of the magic trick, like really diligently, yeah. you know, mapping out the arc of this book um, to present it as so the three stages of the magic trick, where I present something ordinary, the idea of love, perhaps, uh, and then take that, I make it disappear. Mm -hmm. And then in the third section, I attempt gradually to bring it back and then realize that I cannot bring it back in the same way that it was when it was was present because the whole thing the whole thing about the prestige the whole thing that um the whole thing that's said in the movie is that the magic trick does not work unless you can bring back that which was was vanished but i think the real thing that i was trying to come to terms with in this book is that it is hard to reformat a broken heart and have it humming at the same frequency it was when it was whole it might be humming at a different not not necessarily worse it might be humming at an even better frequency I'm probably in better emotional shape now than I was uh, when I wrote this book, which is why coincidentally it's hard to return to the book sometimes. Wow. But, but that's the thing, right? Is that um, you know, if you if you put the cloth over the rabbit and the rabbit disappears, and then you make it reappear, but the rabbit that was once white is now a brown rabbit with red eyes. It's a different machine, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, and so I got really obsessed with the, the 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 quote. I don't even know if I added this quote in the book, but. The thing where the thing in the prestige where um, the magician wants the machine that will make him that will clone him so he can do the the ultimate disappearing reappearing trick but in order for that to work he has to kill himself every night he has to drown himself in right. tesla bowie's tesla says the notorious thing where he's like have you considered the cost of owning a machine like this and he goes well money's no object and he says well, yeah but have you considered the cost and that i think to think about entering into anything with another person, uh, not to be mechanical and cold, um, but to think about it as a, a type of machinery that we don't always crawl out of the same way, um, you know, was a, was a real project of this book. I love that. And, and also, I know that movie, and I knew what a prestige was, because a lot of people hear prestige and they think, oh, respect or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, no, the prestige is the, is the revelatory moment, the moment when what you thought was one thing is not what you thought it was. And you, you, are, you are changed by what you discover. I was also, I looked up when um, you made um, kind of an oblique reference to something Tesla was famous for saying. He said, be alone. Mm. That is the secret of invention. Be alone. That is when ideas are born. And you made a more oblique reference to at least the one, as I recall it. And uh, I was wondering is, were you, is that how you think about your, yourself as an artist? Do you feel drawn to solitude? Do you prefer uh, being, you know, flying solo as you work or, you know? I don't think so, but I think I would like to not think that I'm drawn to solitude, particularly in the work, right? I believe in like, you know, I'm, I was fortunate enough to come up with and be friends with a cohort of writers who I just love a great deal. You know, I came up through Poetry Slam and I kind of came up in the era of Poetry Slam that I felt feels to me not once in a lifetime. I mean, you know, the great Mahogany Brown and Rochester's own, the great Rachel McKibbins would correct me quickly if I said once in a lifetime. Right. Um, but I feel like it was a, you know, I came up with Danette Smith and Franny Choi and right. Sam Sachs and Cam Walker Rich and Nate Marshall and right. uh, all these people who are, you know, we've, we've forged these bonds with each other. And so it feels foolish to say that I love to do the work alone because I feel very much like I'm doing the work alongside these folks, even when we're not putting our heads together on poems. But when I actually think about it, you know, I'm, I am someone who has to be shaken out of my, um, I have to be shaken out of my commitment to isolation. I'm the youngest of four, you know, I spent a lot of time alone as a kid and I spent a lot of time getting comfortable with myself being alone as a kid. Um, and I had to spend a lot of time figuring out how to navigate the, that 
thin difference between loneliness and isolation. Right, right. And now that I think I've mastered that, it is hard for me to say, it is hard for me to think about isolation and, and want to get out of it, particularly in the past year. You know, I, you know, I often joke, you know, I got vaccinated and all that, but I joke that like my life's not going to change because, you know, being in my house kind of alone has brought me to new depths of joyful isolation that I, I truly probably need to shake myself out of with any luck I will. Well, I understand that too. Um, all right, a couple more things, and maybe if people are asking other questions, we'll try and bring them in. Um, another thing that I really dig about what you're doing is, I mean, you have these passages like, bring to me your palms overflowing with the production of your most intemperate anguish. And then on the facing page, the title is Love Your Niggas. Yeah, I just love that, man. I love how it's this Thanks, like too. one one place you're thinking, oh, hi, elegant English. And then the hood just moves right back into the book. I just love that. It's something yeah. that fascinates me. I was wondering if as you were coming along as a, as a younger writer, did you were you encouraged or discouraged to use the kind of diction that you're able to use both like from the corner and, you know, yeah. from the tower? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I have no, like, quote, unquote, formal training in writing, you know, oh, okay. I didn't go to college to study writing, I, I didn't get I don't have an MFA. Oh, and so much of the writers I read, were writing in the language of the people, you know, I was before uh, this, I was talking about August Wilson, who would like, you know, um, write in the language of the people of Pittsburgh, and Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote in the language of Harlem, and um, was admonished for it, you know, and yeah. um I first understood only how to write in the language of the people I knew and loved. Um, you know, my first book of poems is a series of poems in the voice of my barber that are pretty much exactly word for word. If they're not even poems, they're just kind of transcriptions, right? Oh, because I honor my people speaking the way my people speak on, on the streets I grew up on is musical and poetic and has a sonic quality to it that I value. And so I return to that first. Um, but I, I, I think I sometimes, you know, try to trick people into, to, to imagining that as elegance. Oh yeah, oh, oh, it, there is elegance in it. But I, I agree, I, I agree. In terms, I agree. Of, in terms of like the ways in which the general public views language. Because right. I love, I, I mean, I love it. When I was in grad school, when I was studying writing, as you can imagine, there were not many black folks in grad school with me. Um, and I, I was writing uh, a poem and I was using a lot of, you know, dialect, you know, from the corner. And, uh, and when the dude, one of the dudes who was teaching me said, oh, you shouldn't write like that. It won't last. And, and even then I thought, <laughs> have you ever heard of Lysa Hughes? Yeah, people don't know history. They don't know history. I'm like, have you ever heard of Zora Neale Hurston? Do you think they don't, they didn't last? I mean, you know, but anyway, but I was just curious about if you had an, a, a parallel experience, but you just kind of came out of nowhere with your partners and just started writing. Was there something that drew you to writing in the first place? Or did you like, even as a kid, just always kind of write and, and- I was a pretty prolific reader as a kid, but not a very prolific writer. Uh -huh. um, and I was a music critic before I was a poet. Yeah, I heard, I've heard. Um, and this thing had happened around 2011. I didn't start writing poems until like 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. and, um, this thing had happened around 2011 where I was having a hard time getting music writing assignments because editors were saying my language was too poetic and too meandering. And I didn't take that as like an insult or, or like, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I have to change the way I write. It was kind of like, I have to figure out how to hone this and learn, you know? So I got a bunch of books. I, got, I did this thing where I asked people for poetry book recommendations and I would, read, I would read poetry books and get to the back of them and read the acknowledgements. And then I would circle the poets' names um, who were acknowledged in the book and then go get their books. You know, it was like building a lineage based off of like, okay, who did, this, who did, who did Adrian Matika learn from? I got to find their books. Because really one of the first poems I ever read that, I, that made me feel like I could write poems the way I wanted to was Maggot Brain in Mixology by Matika. And mm. I remember reading Maggot Brain and being like, because my whole thing with poems is like, I don't want to write poems. I want to get, I want to write about music. But then it was someone, it was like someone tapped me on the shoulder and was like, yo, you know, you can do both of those things. And I remember reading Maggot Brain and being like, this is it. This is a poem I'm going to be chasing my whole life. <laughs> and I think I still am in a lot of ways. I read at IU last week. I always feel like I embarrassed him because I read at IU last week and Matika was like, Adrian Matika was like moderating the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the students during the Q&A was like, you know, what's the first poem that like flipped the switch for you? I was like, yo, the man is like right there. You know what I mean? Like you're learning from him. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so that, but, but that's the poem I've been chasing my whole life.
Oh, that's cool. That's really nice. Yeah, I didn't know. I just, of course, I thought at least the way I'm looking at what you do craft wise, it just was so sophisticated. I thought, I wonder who this guy studied with. <laughs> so, it's, cool. it's cool that that uh, that you that this is just an organic development in your work. Yeah. As I say we could talk. I could talk to you for two hours. I'm not sure you'd want to hear it, but I, but. Uh, but yeah, but there's so many things because you do things craft wise, like there's all kinds of stuff you're doing on the page in these books. I mean, you have those those poems that look almost like prose poems. Maybe they could be prose poems. And then you have the jams that have all that white space in them. Yeah. And then, you know, you're doing a lot of things, man, that I really admire. I just, because it just gives, in terms of traveling through a book, it gives you just a different, it's like looking out the window, driving down a highway, you just, you get different kind of views as you move along. And it's like the same thing with the book. I'm just like, you turn the page and something's happening that wasn't happening on the page before. And then you'll echo, of course, something that did happen before. I don't know, it was really intricately made. Anyway, I don't want to spend time on that. One thing I, I wanted to ask about was, <clears throat> you make reference to Don't Stop Believing by Journey. Love that song. Yeah, so do I. What's Love it. Funny, what's funny is when I was growing up, I don't know whether, whether you ran into this or not, but when I was growing up, it was just a, a small group of, of us, you know, black cats who dug rock. Nobody really was knew about it. It'd be me and I had like three friends and we would be trading these rock songs. We were all hip to the temptations and, and of course everything that was happening at R&B, but we had a little click <laughs> that was into rock. And there were very few people who cared at all for, for what we were into on that on that side. Did you run into the same thing or did you have a group of people or it was just normal for you to move from rock to r &B Oh yeah, it was pretty normal. I mean, I came yeah. up on, on the, I came up with hip hop but I also came up on the punk scene in okay. the Midwest. And a lot of those people who were into hip hop with me were also on the punk scene with me, you know, like I, and, and I had older siblings too, who were very into expanding their musical taste, which I think uh, is the greatest gift. Well, that's um, right. You know, I had older siblings who were into grunge at the time and metal and all this stuff. And I had parents who were into soul and funk. And so everything just kind of collided. And uh, I got to hear a lot of sounds growing up. Um, and through that hearing, I got to, through that witnessing, I kind of built a musical blueprint I could, I could stumble into. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's really nice. But that was, I mean, this not to say I couldn't imagine that you would dig a song like that, but it was just like, I just wasn't necessarily yeah. expecting it because my, in my experience, my taste in music is pretty broad, but there were just a very select, small, very small group of people that I could hang out with and talk to about yes and, and the who and all that when I was, you know, in junior high school and high school. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, but that was hip too. And I don't know if I think uh, Dan wanted me to open it up to see if people in the audience had questions. I don't want to like make that and, you know, ignore that. So if anybody has a question out there, I guess you can put it out in the chat and I'll give it a look. Um, otherwise I'll ask one more uh, question. There was, um, there's a line um, in another poem, uh, in Ohio, the stars sink their fangs into the neck of the night sky, and I am not afraid. And I was wondering whether, did you just stumble into surrealism or did you, <laughs> somebody you read that was like, oh man, they're doing some really wild stuff. I will broaden my sense of, of what is logical or what is beyond logic and how that works. I was just curious. I probably Octavia Butler, right? Which is like the far yeah. end of, of that spectrum. But yeah, I read I, Octavia I Butler when I was young. And I think that just got me in the mood to understand that anything in the poem is possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's it, you know? And, and like um, the kind of like playfulness that, that uh, I just think Terrence, is so Terrence Hayes is so good at like um, doing whatever he can language wise to twist the same word or idea. Right. Like, he, right. like one of those sonnets, um, there's that like Jim Crow, the Jim Crow one where he like plays with the word Crow and Jim so many times yeah. that like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's so good at making you believe that you saw something you, you didn't see or making, oh, that poem, uh, the poem that like I used to, to make an epigraph in the book, what it looked like, where at the beginning he's yeah. like, it's like I always say, never mistake what it is for what it looks like. Right. And then the poem unfolds and at the end he's like, it's like I said before, never mistake what it looks like for what it is. And uh -huh. it's, that's like such a small movement, but it fucks me up every time where it's where I gotta scroll back up like, wait, did he say that? And I think that kind of playfulness in that kind yeah. of like self-satisfaction with pulling a trick off yeah. is also kind of feeds into that. 
Okay. All right. I'm glad you know Octavia Butler. I mean, so many people read and strictly in their own genre. And I always tell people like, why? There's so yeah, much. Yeah, I read content. widely. Yeah. I mean, Octavia Butler was a, a total monster. One of my great regrets is that I never met her or ever got to hear her read or, you know, that's one of my great regrets. Um, she died so suddenly and relatively young. Though. Yeah. All right. So any, let me see, let me check out the chat and see if, any, okay, here's one. Um, this is a kind of an obvious one or maybe one that you'll find interesting. Um, is there a limit to what you're willing to say in your poetry? Places you will not go because they are too sacred, too honest, too anything. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm actually a pretty private person despite Fortune in some way being a very public book. Um, I think I'm very good at like keeping things to myself and, and not stepping over boundaries that would invite um, an interest in parts of my life that I don't want people to be invited into. But I, I, that, that's something I honed, you know, that's not something, um, you know, I think that's something I came to pretty late. I think actually with this book, because this book is, I think on its surface, this book is a very public book, but it's also an immensely private book. Right. Um, and learning to balance that has been good. No, no, I agree. And I understand that too, because even though I was talking earlier about how intimate it felt, I understood that this wasn't about, it wasn't a book of too much information for lack yeah. of a better term. Yeah. It was just, there was a sense that, as I, as I said, I, I don't think I can say it any, any more clearly, truthfully. I mean, much of what happens in a poem, as you know, happens outside of the realm outside of language, of yep. you know? Yeah. But there is something going on in this book that does feel like I'm being talked to very, very directly and honestly, but never did I feel like, you know, uh, this should be in a journal or, you know, I never felt that way. So I really like the balance that you strike here. Um, let me think. And there's someone else who says, um, uh, what is it about a uh, punk that resonated so deeply with you? Um, the fact that it was the songs were short and fast and loud. And, um, you know, I think that when you're young, it's easy to feel like an outsider, even if you're not. Like, I don't think I was as much of an outsider as I imagined myself to be. Right. But, um, you know, it felt good to hurl myself into a space where I was even more of an outsider than I already was, perhaps. Okay. Um, right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I still now, of course, that that feeling resonates with me, but I, you know, I don't really go to punk shows anymore. I'm too old. I'm too right. old to go to punk shows. <laughs> I understand you don't want to be the old guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I guess this will be the last question I'll ask, and then maybe you could close with a poem, as Dan has suggested. Uh, he said, this is a question. Um, I'm wondering how Mr. Abdurraqib knows something is good. How does he decide what to send into the world? Well, I don't know if I, well, it's because I work outside the binary of good and bad. And instead, I think that I've gotten very good at asking myself, did I achieve what I set out to do here? Or did I make something that feels to me close to how I envisioned it in the world? So it's funny, the last one, you know, I wrote, I wrote 35 of those flower poems, and mm -hmm. I think only 17 made it in the book. So that means there's like 18 that I still have in a file. Right. And through that, I had to ask myself the question of, is this serving the purpose that I dreamed it to serve? If the answer is no, then that's a more useful question than is this good or is this bad? Gotcha. Like the one I want to read uh, did not make it in the book just because at the time I felt like it was too personal, but it's probably not. But, you know, one of these things, I, you know, so I don't really know what's good or what's bad, but I think I try to stay true to what feels like I've hit the emotional core of something that I'm interested in. Okay. All right, well, that seems like a great transition to the poem. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. This is a real pleasure to talk oh, to man, you. Oh, man, an honor, the, a real honor, Hanif, a real honor. Um, all right, this is uh, the last poem I'm going to read. It's a poem, one of the flower poems that didn't make it in the book. And I have a bunch of these that I, I kind of have gone back through and um, edited a bit, and we'll see if I do anything with them. But this one is about the zinnia which and it has to be stated that I don't know anything about flowers. I still don't know anything about flowers. I wrote all those fucking poems and I still don't know anything about flowers. So, but um, I do know some stories behind flowers. So this is about the zinnia, which is the first flower or a flower that opened in space. How can black people write about flowers at a time like this? 
The news says the Zinnia opened its bright orange palm into the darkness of space. The news says the space crew tilted the closed fist of the flower bud towards the sunlit edge of the moon, and that was all it took. The news wants me to know what is possible in a place where lonely people go to be forgotten. The news is asking me to believe that I cannot fathom the frequency beauty might tremble at, given some impossible luminescence. It is here, I will tell you, I have never cared about the stars as much as anyone I've loved has cared about the stars. I mean this. I can no longer lie my way into your hearts. If I am to believe in anything at the end of the world, it cannot be the stars, which have yet to swallow anything I can see from my gleaming and light-filled city. This city I have dreamed into a planet. This planet I have hatched from my own grief. Dark planet of funerals and ominous fortunes. I love you the way I might love the magic of a star falling onto a land where it grew a field of zinnias. The news says one must care for the flower in outer space like they might care for a love what they mean is holding the food to a mouth that might not always open for you. They mean heat the way Whitney sings it in the last chorus, curtain pulled back on the invisible syllable, the space where two people pause before their lips collide for the first time, heat sticky and breathless as any saint in a sinful hour. All I can say to that is when the floods are sent for this world again, we will all be doomed in the next world. I am sorry to be the bearer of bad news or any news. There was a man in space who was responsible for whispering a song to the zinnia every night before he drifted to sleep when he was asked what he sang he said he hummed the melody his mother hummed in his ear when he would weep as a boy in the aftermath of some mischief when i said the flower was tilted into the sunlit moon back then i was thinking of the way i could feel the gentle pulse stuttering percussion through the wrists of the last person i loved who some days when i would pull the blankets over my head who some days when from underneath that makes shift darkness. I pretended the stars were close enough to be seeds, who some days would rest her hands on my covered dome, who would sometimes peel back each layer of my homemade planetarium, who would sometimes take two palms and turn my face to a window's light. Today, the house is empty as a hollow cavern with no gravity. The shadows orbit my stillness. When I said I have never cared about the stars as much as anyone I've loved has cared about the stars, I meant that I know the astronaut who hung his mother's song at night, is also the first to touch the window above earth, is also the first to watch the lights flicker on in the city they miss, is also the first with a mind that wanders like a leaf at the mercy of a coming winter's fury. We are all floating and begging for the light somewhere to tell us something. I have returned from oblivion's worse than this one, I promise, but while I am here now, hear me out. I'm sorry. I wish you the humidity of 100 heartbreaks. I wish you a forest of apathetic shadows. I wish you an ending like a new world trying to pry itself open in the name of your impermanent blooming. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. That was really great. Um, such a wonderful reading and such a wonderful discussion. Uh, I want to thank uh, Hanif. I want to thank uh, Tim Siebels. Um, also, our uh, co-sponsor, Quayley. I want to thank the Academy of American Poets and Glenn Hollow. Um, you can catch up with previous readings, including this one, at our website, wab.org. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Tim. Oh, it's a pleasure. A real honor, honey. I really I loved it. So good to meet you and hear you. Thank you. Uh, and and thanks, Dan. And you know, everybody, be safe. Be I will. Safe, yeah. Our paths will cross again, Hanif. I hope. I hope. Good night, everyone. All right. Good See night. You, man.